The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. said, but what the Lord's really laid on my heart is just what I had in the uh, beginning of the service, was to have you stand up that's hurting. I really believe that God is basically saying, I'm going to move you to another level in this, that if you respond properly with a humble heart, it will be like school. You will get stronger and stronger, and the things that used to devastate you will now hurt or irritate you, but the things that irritate you, you will now find a perfect peace in them in the days ahead. Do you understand the example of the woman at, at a funeral who lost a loved one and had the supernatural peace of God guarding her heart and her mind in Jesus? Can you understand that people would say, what's wrong, she didn't care? Because they know the carnality of the human anatomy more than they know the spiritual process of a supernatural God. That's actually the problem, okay? So never apologize that God comforts you Matter of fact, we're told to comfort. As a matter of fact, there's three double I am's in the scripture, and all three in Isaiah. Those three double I am's is to me a passionate, imperative statement made by God himself, different than all the other I am's. It's I am, I am, and nobody else can do this but me. I am, I am your savior, and there's no other God besides me. Do you believe that? So much for the many ways to God, huh? I am, I am, and I am, I am your Savior and or, and or your Deliverer, and no one else can do this. The second double I am that's different than all the other I am's. It's said with an imperativeness. I am, I am the one who removes your transgressions. I am, I am your forgiver, and no one else can forgive sin. No one else. That's why when you're commanded to forgive, it's got to be a joint venture between you and Jesus together forgiving. He is the forgiver living in you. And when you're told to forgive, it has to be out of that union and communion where you are joined together with Him. They that are joined to the Lord are what? One spirit with Him. And it must be out of that new creation reality, the real you, that releases that forgiveness. I am, I am your forgiver, and none can forgive your sins other than God himself. And the last one was, and this is the word of the Lord, I believe, for this morning, uh, particularly for those of you that stood up, but it's good for everybody, those that are listening uh, by YouTube, Ustream. I am, I am the, your comforter. I am, I am your comforter. Nobody can comfort you like I do. Most people put substitutes, self-medicated comforts. But God said, I am, I am the comforter, and everything's a false comfort compared to me. Then he gives us the mandate. If those are the passionate attitudes with, with, with great imperativeness toward us, then as sons and daughters of God, we need to reflect the fact that there's nobody other than him, and he will deliver me out of, the, uh, you know, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers them out of them all. Big word, isn't it? All. Secondly, that if God forgives me with that kind of a passion and a willingness to remove my sin and paid such a tremendous price to do that, I should be a forgiver. The most forgiven people on the face of the earth is you and I. We should be the most forgiving people on the face of the earth then, shouldn't we? We should reflect the heart of the Father to not only, to not only be deliverance-oriented, redemptive orientation, a mindset that is redemptive in all your view, which is a love view, and also that we should be forgivers. And lastly, what does the scripture say in Corinthians? Comfort them with the same comfort. You can't give something you don't have. You've had to have that victory in your own life before you can really give it to anybody. Comfort them with the same comfort whereby you were comforted during your time of affliction. That Comfort that you had during your time of affliction was the Holy Spirit or it wasn't really comfort. You don't need a pat on the back. You need Jesus. 
You need the Holy Spirit to guard your heart and your mind through Jesus. And that can be taught, and it's not hard to accomplish it. We're, we're emphasizing now, particularly for those that have been uh, trained in, in our material, you're probably a very emotionally healthy people. But at the same time, that peace challenge will challenge you who are emotionally healthy. The peace challenge covers the areas of practical application in day-to-day -day living. It's one thing to say that I'm, I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It's another thing to walk in it. You, as you received Him, so walk the same way. And so uh, even before uh, I, I get into this message, I want to I share again uh, for the sake of uh, those watching by video. The supernatural power of peace, the power of peace 4 CD set, and the corresponding journal to document your life. You're serious about the Lord, and you know how to deal with your emotional pain, and you're comfortable with that, be challenged to move into lordship. It's one thing to have him as your savior, it's another thing to be challenged that Jesus is Lord. That needs to be the cry of the heart for believers. Lordship would mean that peace, when the peace of God rules, who's ruling? Jesus. That's lordship. A step out of peace, you may still have a relationship, but you just broke fellowship. Fellowship and communion, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. This is what God's looking for in the days ahead. All right, now, here's the message in light of what I felt when I came in the room, because I had several. <laughs> Poor Jennifer, she types, she types out my notes for like nine messages and then I don't know which one I'm gonna give. She's going, is it this one? No, okay, but I'll be prepared for some other day. <laughs> but here's, here's uh, the word of the Lord, and this is, I think, the title that would best depict it. Life is tough. Now, that doesn't sound very optimistic, does it? But that's real. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've removed its ability to harm you. That's the message translation. I've removed its ability to harm you. It doesn't mean there's not tribulation, but I want the God who removes, removes me from the position to where it's damaging me. Now, and here's, here's what, uh, this is one of my favorite stories, so you'll hear this over the years. You're going to hear it again and again, because this is so... This so impressed me. It's in the 1970s and 80s, a psychologist, Norman Garmezi, undertook a now famous study of the children who managed to survive unscathed despite life circumstances that would have emotionally devastated or caused irreparable damage to most people. That's an interesting study. Why do these people, he called it resilience, why do some people under impossible situations, are they resilient? What do they do different? These are unsaved people. These are people who just basically rose out of impossible situations and overcame. And God wants us to all be overcomers. There's a lot of promises in the book of Revelation, and to him who overcomes, I will give to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. There's got to be some keys if in the natural there are people who are resilient. There has to be how much more should we have that same resilience? And what did we, I shared that earlier, uh, even in, a, in the opening prayer, it was basically, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Uh, my friend uh, used to say over and over again, uh, I heard him from the pulpit when I was a young Christian, fail, but don't be a failure. There's a difference. Get up, learn from it, and do what's right. He found, in this study, this secular study, he found that events are not traumatic in and of themselves. And I thought, wow, that's an interesting statement. Events are not traumatic until we see them as traumatic. Huh. I don't know, I, I couldn't get my head around that one at first. Every frightening or traumatic event, no matter how negative it might seem from the sidelines, has the potential to be traumatic or not to the person experiencing it. Huh. The same event can be traumatic to one 
One can have PTSD from a car accident, another one just blow it off. And I'm talking serious car accident. And one just be shook up and get past it. Another one basically has a trauma that just lingers and lingers and they can't get, seem to get past it. Our own attitude determines our resilience or lack of it. Our own attitude. You know, when I was a baby Christian, God took me to the school of the Spirit in prayer. He once told me, attitude determines performance. And he said, you know what, Dennis? It is not positive attitude, negative attitude. He said, the attitude that will determine your performance is the cross. Not a plus sign, not a negative sign, not your likes and dislikes, but the work of the cross is the only true positive. Because anything that passes through the cross yet lives is living in the true positive of resurrection life. It's not just a positive mental attitude. It's a changed, transformed thought pattern that is now under the control of resurrection life from the new creation. So I said, okay, uh, so we can become resilient if our own attitude determines our performance or lack of it. So our own attitude can make any situation and I used to teach this and constantly teach this to my pastors and leaders and home group leaders. You're not going to hear this again and again. You can make a mountain out of a molehill and you can make a molehill out of a mountain. You have that capacity. I'm talking it's still unsaved people. How much more Christians? Unsaved people can make it big or make it small. Now, it's not like what I saw in secular uh, therapy. Secular therapy actually lies. That's not the same as what I'm talking about. I'm talking about it in a kingdom perspective with the ability of God. I've seen in secular situations somebody uh, had a horrific accident and there's blood all over the place. I've had therapists say stupid stuff like, uh, oh, that's not really blood. Just picture that as something other than blood. You know, that's just plain lying. And that person's trauma, you know where that went? It went down under, only to surface again in some other situation. You don't change the reality. The cross brings healing to the reality. You don't have to change reality. That's a false cross. That's make-believe. That's fantasy. And momentarily, the trouble with that is you might momentarily feel better. But only Jesus can take the pain and the sorrow. The only thing that can do is suppress it. And what gets suppressed will be expressed at a later date without your control at some unusual time. So, you can make situations of a mountain or a molehill. You know, 42 years in ministry, when I look back, I've seen so many changed lives, and I like to emphasize that, but I've also seen the ones that didn't get their lives changed, and I saw a pattern. You know what that pattern was? Mountains out of molehills. They've had mental and emotional breakdowns because they made a mountain out of a molehill. You picture one thing and never let it go like a dog with a bone and you will, it will take you down. Hmm? You can make a mountain out of a molehill and you will become less resilient, less likely to become resilient and didn't we say saved or unsaved? You have that capacity to make it big or little. The beautiful thing I loved about forgiveness was you remember in the scripture where, where the Pharisees were all upset with Jesus because he says, your sins are forgiven. And they said, how dare he? Only God can forgive sin. But he says, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? See, big and little does not exist on God's side, does it? That's a fabrication of our, of our natural life, our carnal life. That's the way we perceive big and little. But apparently, some people see the big things as a little bit littler than us, right? And apparently, some people see little things as big mountains. And you give power to what you give attention to. So you stay on it long enough, you make it bigger. You minimize it, you make it smaller. And life goes on. Now, 
If we become less resilient or less likely to be resilient, we can create or exaggerate stressors very easily in our own minds. The danger of the human condition. Human beings are capable of worry and rumination. We can take a minor thing, blow it up in our heads, run through it over and over, drive ourselves crazy until we feel like that minor thing is the biggest thing that ever happened to anybody on the face of the earth. You don't understand what it's like because it's so big in me, right? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I frame adversity as a challenge, you become more flexible. Wow, I wonder how God's going to help me work this out. This is a mess. That's being realistic. It's calling it, it is what it is, but at the same time, there is a hope in God. Flexible, able to deal with it, move on, learn from it, grow, focus on it, frame it as a threat, and a potentially traumatic event becomes an enduring problem. You become more inflexible and more likely to be negatively affected by it. I thought it was interesting. One of the ways we raise leadership here in this church, and I've done it over the years, no matter where I minister, is uh, when you basically correct somebody. And I always give them lots of room. You don't have to do what I say, but I'm going to say it. I watch how they handle correction. Orphans handle correction as rejection. Sons and daughters, is this Hebrews chapter 12, in case you don't know where I'm coming from. Hebrews chapter 12, correction is seen as love to a son or a daughter. If you really love somebody, you're going to tell them. You're not a friend if you just say, well, let's just see what happened. Leave them alone. Let it go. Mm -mm. How many want somebody to tell them? How many have negative, how many have negative emotions? Anybody have negative emotions? Yeah. Those are your friends. Those are your friends. Don't you want a friend to tell you the truth? Yeah. Those negative emotions are your friends. They're telling you, Jesus isn't ruling right now. So hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame are my friends? Well, they can be. If you let them be signals that Jesus isn't ruling right now, there's something in your flesh that's taken over. And it, guess what? Who's at the scene of every crime? You. Right? The blame game is history if you're a believer. You can't just go blaming people. That, that, that doesn't work. They try, he tried that as soon as Adam sinned in the garden. He said, that woman you gave me, she's, or, that doesn't work. There needs to be redemption. There needs to be a blood sacrifice for your sin and Jesus shed his blood for that sin. So the blame game is over. You can't even, ooh, don't, people don't like to go to counseling for me because I don't let them blame. <laughs> After all, I came here to talk about somebody else's issues. Well, that somebody else needs to be here. Maybe we can show them how to help themselves. All right? But life is tough. How many believe life is tough? Life is tough. And there's good and bad that happens every day. So you have the capacity to see it. It's like Jennifer wrote in, uh, she did a, a, a study, uh, Jennifer likes to teach on the Constitution. And, and in one of that, she gave a historical view of uh, a tale of two kingdoms. And it was like, she showed historically what God was doing historically, a great panorama of history. She likes total concept. And then underneath, it's what the devil was doing during the, all through history. And guess what? Good and evil are happening at the same time. It's a question of what you want to focus on. You give power to what you give attention to. You have the capacity to make it a mountain or a molehill. Now, if you become inflexible, you will become negatively affected. But so far, every Christian now, I'm going to mess with the Christians now, we're talking about general, generalities. Every Christian that I saw that had a breakdown, I mean, what would you would call a serious breakdown, had one thing 
one thing that they just couldn't talk about anything else but that one person, one situation, one scenario, and they played it over and over again like it was your whole life. If you're doing that, you're entering into the opposite of resilience. Anoint your ear to hear what the Spirit's saying because this will change your life if you can see the contrast here. God, anoint my ear to hear this in the Spirit. Resilience is the opposite of resentment. That word resentment means to play it again. You play it again. You give power to what you give attention to. That's the basic principle. That's true of all of life. Saved or unsaved. How did these children under impossible situations... I've told you this story before. The one I love the most was the little boy, latchkey kid, parents irresponsible, father gone, mother drinks. He goes to school, no food in the house, but there was some bread. He took two pieces of bread and pretended he had a sandwich so that nobody would feel sorry for him. He's an overcomer. He made it, and he made it big in life. And there was no resentment, only obstacles that needed to be overcome. I'm going to overcome anybody feeling sorry for me today or knowing my true condition instead of whining and complaining, which killed them in the wilderness. I always loved that. You know what those graves were called? The graves of craving. I want what I want, and I want it now, and I'm not getting it, and woe is me. Think about it. The suicide rate. Anybody that has an emotional breakdown or even suicidal thoughts, you are locked into one thing that you're, not, you're like a dog with a bone and you won't let it go. And you know what? When you lock into one thing like that, a person, place, or thing, you exclude all the rest of life and all of the potential to maximize your potential and do something with your life. You're good for nothing when you focus on one thing. That's why Paul says, this one thing I do. I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. That's the only one thing you can do that blesses everything. Anything else is a substitute. Anything else is a distraction. Anything else you will make a mountain out of a molehill. But let's pray right now for that. Before I even get any farther, I want to pray for 42 years of watching the people that I couldn't help that had a breakdown because there was one thing that they couldn't let go of. I, I prayed with a leader one time and it just broke my heart because they, they came for ministry but they didn't want anything to do with the work of the cross. They said, I demand from God to have a break. I need a break. The pressure is too much. I need a break. You're not going to get a break. Isn't that sad? Those are the ones that I saw that went over the deep end as believers. I demand, you can demand all you want, a break. God is looking for you to respond to tough things in life. He's giving you his grace and his ability to say, I've removed, in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome and I've removed this ability to harm you is what the message says. I love that. I've removed this ability to harm you. Yes, stuff happens, but it doesn't have to harm you. You are the one that makes it harm you. And you can make a mountain out of a molehill and a molehill out of a mountain. You choose. I so respect these children that just were able to overcome. They were non-complainers. They weren't whiners. Joe and Helen whiners don't usually last in my church. They usually leave. You ever know a Joe and Helen whiner? Joe, what Helen? <laughs> okay, that, they don't usually make it. They killed them in the wilderness. It'll kill you in the modern-day New Testament church. Now, resilience versus resentment, they are exact opposites. You cannot entertain both of them at the same time. <laughs> That's like the people who used to, uh, didn't know I had discerning of spirits, and they used to lie to me, and they'd tell me, I love my mother, and down here it's going, <clears throat> and I'm going, I can feel that, I can feel that, and there's a... <laughs> You're saying the right words, but your heart's somewhere else. All right. 
So we would say tactful things like, well, let's, maybe we should go a little deeper on that subject anyway. Just love your mother a little bit more. You can't entertain both at the same time. Actually, this is for the men who don't think emotions applies to them. All right, all you macho men don't have any emotions. Jennifer says you don't have any good ones. We've seen you on the road. We know you got emotions. Don't give me that. All right? But basically, here's your favorite word that's non-emotional. Stress. I have stress at work. I have stress at home. I have stress in the neighborhood. I have stress even in this church service is causing me stress. All right? Good. Because stress means you're being emotionally controlled. Oh, there's that word. You're being emotionally controlled by people and or circumstances. What happens when God is controlling you? Peace. Peace. <laughs> and the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. That's lordship. That's not Jesus is my savior, and I'm under attack. I, am, I get so weary of Christians under attack when most of the time it's their carnality beating them up. And of course you're under attack. You've got a target on you. I'm hurt, afraid, resentful. Hit me. And he will. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Close the door, and peace will guard your heart and your mind. That means no matter what comes against you, cannot penetrate the peace of God. If it says, if the Bible says the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind, is that true? <laughs> Are you doing it? Uh, the, you need the peace challenge, don't you? The peace challenge is not for the faint at heart. The peace challenge is someone that does know how to deal with their emotions or you will be a miserable failure. The peace challenge basically teaches you how much during the day did I stay in peace? And really, if you're mature, you should basically say, how much, how often did I lose my peace during the day? Did I make every business decision from the place of peace? Did I make every decision from the place of peace? In a hostile environment like my job <laughs> or church, in a hostile environment like that, when I went there, did, did I evangelize the atmosphere or did the atmosphere evangelize me? My angry coworker, did that make me angry? Did he evangelize me or did I bring a comforting feeling to them and calm them down merely because of displacement. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world, and my mere presence calmed him down, like Saul being calmed down by David's <laughs> spirit. Huh? No. Resentment is like fear. It guarantees a bad outcome. And resentment is the opposite of this resilience, this ability to bounce back. Resent comes from the Latin word, to feel again, to relive it over and over again, and to feel it again. Well, what happens if you feel the same thing again and again? You make it stronger. It's like a muscle. You give power to what you give attention to, and it's going to, be, it's going to become more and more a part of your life. We hang on to our pain. Why do, we, why do we hang on to pain? Instead of simply feeling the pain of disappointment, we mull the bad experience over and over again in our head. Why do we hang on to pain? You want to know the root to this? Because your pride was insulted. Your pride. Pride is rooted, rooted in Lucifer. It's rooted in Satan. Humility is rooted in God. And people that live in resentment have a pride problem. That's the root issue. They were wounded and they don't, like a dog with a bone, they don't want to give it up. And resentment actually releases a chemical in the physical body that causes an addiction to the resentment. It actually feels good in a sick kind of way. Huh? Is that dopamine, Jennifer? And God, relationally, when you forgive a perpetrator, that is legitimately guilty and hostile, 
When you forgive, that doesn't mean you have to reconcile. It simply means you're free from the resentment. And that brings healing even to your physical body. Now, if resilience means the exact opposite of elasticity, or the ability to keep springing back again and again. Don't you want to keep springing back again and again? Come on, I love discipling someone that goes, no, I can't do it. Okay. <laughs> that prompt obedience to God, I know people like that, and they're, and they're quality material. And I've watched them from victory to victory, from faith to faith, from glory to glory. Those are the successful ones. Oh, that hurts. Ooh, that hurts. Oh, that feels better. I'll just take it to Jesus. The work of the cross. Now, <laughs> resilience means that emotionally, if I'm resilient, if I learn to bounce back, if I learn prompt obedience as a believer, I will regain strength and my spirit will be indicative of what it should be indicative of as a believer. Life is good. Life has problems, but life is good. The most challenging scripture I had somewhere in my notes here, I don't know where, but this buoyancy, this nothing can keep me down for long, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Life is tough, but he gets back up. The challenging scripture for me was, uh, I came across the New American Standard translation of uh, Colossians 1, 11, I believe, where it says, being steadfast and patient with joy. And I went, wait a minute. You break that down. Steadfast has to do with all of circumstances. That means all the goofy stuff that happens during any given day, good and bad steadfast in circumstances and patient with people. And that's the goofy people, the good, the bad, the ugly, and all the goofy ones. With joy. That requires a supernatural transaction. You can't work that up. You can't fake that. Steadfast in circumstances and patient with people with joy. You have to enter into a whole other realm as a believer to where it's basically, God, how do we respond? And you know what? He taught me this as a baby Christian. We lose sight of some of these truths that we learned in the early years. And we need to come back to them and take them to another level that's deeper. But here's what the Lord taught me. I'm a baby Christian, just got off drugs, was on welfare, didn't have enough money to pay for anything, had $12 in my checkbook. The transmission goes out on the car. And I, I'm going hundreds of dollars. On, and I went, but I'm just innocent babe in the woods. And it's the smart way to be. I went, wonder how God's going to work this one out. And had peace. That was a totally foreign experience. That is not a normal fleshly experience. I wonder how God's going to work this out. So I drove down to uh, Marentian's transmission place. And I drove down there and the guy said, oh, there's nothing here. I'm going to put some fluid in it. That'll be $12.50. Left the few pennies in the checkbook. Whoa, God is big and great. And then somewhere along the line, you get smart and you forget some of that stuff, huh? If you get too smart for God, you're not smart. God's basically saying this buoyancy is something that it can't keep me down. You can knock me down, but I'm going to get up. Though the righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Not so with the wicked. They're down for the count. But God's basically saying, the truth is, every day contains both good and bad. Every day contains good and bad. It's like Jennifer's tale of two kingdoms. There's bad stuff happening, but at the same time, good stuff is happening. If you want to have the eyes of Jesus, you've got to get the heart of Jesus. If you want to see, you've got to see. And again, I'm going back to all my earliest revelations and repenting and telling God, you know what? I think I forgot some of those earlier revelations. Do you know the first thing he taught me? I started my first church in a little uh, vacuum cleaner repair building. And I'm going, okay, I started the church. I got enough to pay the rent. I just realized that people come, there's not any chairs to sit on. 
and, and only a handful of chairs. So I hope there's only a handful of people come. Then a handful of people come, I received an offering. I'm going, but how do I get the music out? I don't sing by myself. I don't know how to sing. I had a little boom, I got a little boom box. So then I got the boom box and then I went, we receive an offering. And then when we received the offering, I went, oh my goodness, I got to buy more chairs. And then I, I don't know how to do this stuff. And you know what the Lord said to me at that time? And I must have lost sight of it over the years. And now it's a coming back really strong. He made it very, very clear. There's giants in the land, but they're glass. And he showed me everything that I saw as pressure was real, but glass. Glass in the context that I'm going to teach you to see right through that to Jesus, who is the source, the author, and the finisher. So you're not denying the existence of the giants. You're looking through them. And it, it cultivates within you to walk by faith and not by sight. Because you're seeing in a different dimension. You're dealing clearly with the earth. I'm not in denial. That's what some people accuse that of. When your God confidence rises up in your heart and you're walking by faith, you're, you're seeing those things which are not as though they were because you're looking at the author and the finisher. But you're not denying the reality of the giants. You're calling them giants. You're calling them resistance. You're calling them situations that are negative. But you can make a mountain out of it or a molehill. You can be the haves or the have-nots. The daily life is a combination of positive and negative. Daily life is not an easy, smooth running time. You know what, Christians? We need to die to this. I had a good day. Why don't you just have a God day? You're calling a good day no obstacles. Well, how do you even know you're in victory? Without something to overcome, you don't even know if you're making it or not. I used to get a kick out of it. The more I learned to walk in peace, there were people say, well, you don't understand because nothing's wrong in your life. If you overcome, there's suddenly nothing wrong in your life if you're an overcomer. You have to be a whiner and a complainer like them. And then they, then they call that ministry when you, oh, poor you, I know how you feel, I'm the same way. That makes as much sense ministry-wise, as going to someone who's depressed and asking for prayer. Do you ever ask a depressed person to get prayer? No. Well, I, I don't either. I want someone that's overcome, someone some got some victory. All right? It's continually disturbed by big and small things. If you are constantly disturbed by big and small things, you're going you're gonna to look like a, uh, what do they call that? What's the psychological thing? Manic depressed. Okay, manic depressive. Bipolar. One minute they're bipolar. One minute they're high and giddy and everything is great. And the next minute I quit. I'm going to kill somebody. I die. I wanna... <laughs> Actually, we're all like that. It's just a question of degree. <laughs> right? But. I lose something, something goes wrong, my responsibilities are burdensome, my children are demanding, finances are lacking, sickness, personality clashes, clashing viewpoints, hard decisions. It is at that point that we find it hard to grasp that this is precisely God's purpose. <laughs> I can remember Jennifer didn't like my driving. I wanted everyone to take Dennis Clark's School of Driving, and everyone on the road should abide by my rules. Because after all, I, I fashioned this driving one. And that's when Jennifer says, Honey, I was thinking. Right then, I'm devastated. I repent. I repent. <laughs> Jennifer was thinking, I repent. The road is a microcosm of the kingdom. I know, oh boy. The kingdom is love. Love is the essence of the kingdom. Love is patient. Love is kind. God places those people on the road exactly where he wants to. Even that slow person? Mm -hmm. Because you have an opportunity now to respond. How did you respond to that slow person? Mm. 
Okay. So it's at this spot, even though we find it hard to grasp, that precisely God's purpose that his sons and daughters must be involved in disturbing human relations situations. It's his plan that we be involved in disturbing situations. No more had a great day. Nothing disturbed me. How many people did you disturb <laughs> during that? I don't have anybody to forgive. How many people are lying bloody trying to forgive you? Huh? We ask useless questions and make the mistake of meaning of life if we say, will there be no let up in this continual pressure? No, there won't. <laughs> we better learn how to handle it then, huh? And trust me, whenever you say you don't understand what I've been through, 42 years of ministry, I've seen just about everything. And guess what? I've never had someone say, Jesus doesn't know what I've been through. That's where your focus needs to be. Not on somebody else. They don't have to understand what you've been through. Jesus understands, and he's your source and your solution. Now, if I'm the function in my proper place as a son, an inheritor of God's universe and my eternal destiny, I'm going to need how to learn how to be a son and function in adverse circumstances, aren't I? I'm going to have to learn how do I function in adverse circumstances. Like I said, learn relationships in the church. That's only a semi-hostile environment. When I was a young pastor, I said, this is where the church is where the, who would watch a soap opera? All they have to do is get involved in church relationally. It's where the stomach turns. <laughs> okay? It's where the action is. It's real life. But it's also the place of schooling. Rain, training for reigning later on in life. You learn how to respond properly. Make mistakes, but don't be a failure. Make mistakes, but learn from it. Do what's right. Most of what someone would say, Pastor, that's, that's so much wisdom. Most of that wisdom came from me doing it wrong first and going, I don't want to do it that way no more. Huh? Now, if I'm going to function properly, we need to learn that a son or a daughter, remember, don't take this message as, oh, that's hard, I feel rejected, because that's, what is rejection a sign of? An orphan spirit. It's someone that doesn't know how to relate to other people and doesn't see, perceive God properly either. You see him as this mean person in the sky that just wants to clobber you when you make a mistake. But basically, as sons, we should receive correction with from a loving father who wants the best for us and wants us to get us to overcome all the obstacles in life and truly be resilient in our heart. An ability for buoyancy and to bounce back. But humans, the scripture actually says if we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him. If we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him. Human beings have a natural tendency to react negatively to anything that rubs us the wrong way. You know what they used to say? Scratch a sheep and out pops a wolf. <laughs> <You know. laughs> if it rubs you the wrong way, you see what's in there, don't you? Huh? I don't care about your nice Christianese face. This is not a seeker-friendly church, by the way. Did you notice that? <laughs> Sometimes we're not even friendly. But I'll tell you one thing. You'll get the truth. Speak the truth in love. If you speak the truth in love, there's a redemptive solution. If they, if they can only correct you without giving you a solution, that's not love. The solution's always love. To just correct your faults means nothing. Give you a redemptive solution, and you're loving them. Sons and daughters receive it. Orphans see it only as rejection. As a matter of fact, there's people that I've wanted to disciple over the years. And I'd watch them flunk the test because basically I would tell them no on something minor and then watch how they respond to a no. You can't disciple someone that can't handle any kind of, because actually that's, at that point it's not even correction, it's instruction. If you can't even handle instruction, where are you going to go from there? You've got to go your own way. Now, we must learn to accept praise, our adversities, 
and the reality of life's pressures are constant. We replace our negative with God's positive. And I told you that basically what he showed me was it's not positive mentality versus negative. That won't last long. The only true positive is a genuine, that which has been taken through the cross, that which passes through death yet lives in resurrection life. So <clears throat> I want to get to some of the, I think we've enlarged the problem. I think we ought to go to a solution. I'm going to skip a lot of stuff because we're, all we're doing is we're enlarging the problem. Can you see there is a problem? <laughs> and it's us. <laughs> now we have to go to God because <laughs> God is going to bring us to the place where it's a total revolution when we move from the negative seeing to positive seeing. Jesus saw God in everything, even the negative. Oh, Holy Spirit, teach us to do the same thing. Teach us to do that. What a remarkable ability to see in the spirit realm, to see what God is doing more than what the devil's doing. Uh, and, you know, having, having really received discernment from the time I was a baby Christian, uh, I'm the least tolerant of people using the word discernment when they don't have a redemptive solution. They only see a problem. I don't even have to be a Christian to see problems. That's not a gift. The gift is basically the restoration or the redemptive solution. Without a vision, without a prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraint. The people run wild. You perish. Without a what kind of vision? Redemptive vision prophetic vision without something that's birthed out of the heart of God. So there's many people crashing and burn with your dreams because their dreams weren't birthed in God. They're birthed in, I want what I want and I want it now. I want to skip to something that I just saw recently. And that is, I've preached this a million times that when God wants to build and bring you to your inheritance as a Christian, he uses a pattern based on a principle. And this is so simple. This, is, this should be third grade level. God has supernaturally put people in your life as divine appointments. This is not complicated. Now listen. Divine appointments, go, there's four levels. Divine appointments become divine connections. Greater and lesser knittings. Some are greater, some are lesser, but they're knit by the Spirit of God. Thirdly, in those connections, there is a divine assignment. Because, you know, he wants you to live in something bigger than yourself. To be part of anything bigger than yourself. Two or three impresses God. He says, there, I'll be in the midst. If you can find two or three people that can come into alignment. So the third level is alignment, divine alignment, and the fourth one is divine purpose. Once God can get your heart to where he can put the appointments that he has together, and he, he, he predestined these relationships, and he predestined a plan for you. Look up, there's four predestined in the Bible. He predestined you for relationship, and he predestined you to be part of something else purpose, corporate purpose. Now, here's what I saw. If this divine appointments become a divine connection, you enter into a divine assignment for the purposes of God. Of course, we know it's to bring many sons to glory. All right? I saw with the people that could not receive ministry or never got any better, I saw these four perverted. For every Christian that I could not give them the tools to help themselves with them and God, there was an obstacle. It was they had a divine appointment and the relationship was not God. It was another person, place, or thing. 
This one thing was not God. This one thing, they're like a dog with a bone. They were into the idolatry of a ministry, a job, it could be a thing, a person, an agenda. Oh, how many people could have helped if they could have died to their agenda? But they're like a dog with a bone with that agenda. And they could not, they, you cannot be available for divine appointments when you're caught in a divine agenda. This one thing is not God. Your dream or your vision, I don't care how many courses you've taken on your dream and uh, your vision and take a course on learning what you want. I don't care how you do that. If it doesn't begin in God and end in God, it's not God. Your dream, if it does not begin in God or end in God, it's not God. It's all about you. If it ends in you, what would be good for you? So that divine appointment becomes a divine connection. And we've, our recent book on soul ties is basically that. You make divine connections with things. It could be your job. You could be a jobaholic. But it could be to the form of idolatry. So just because it's socially acceptable doesn't mean you're not addicted. And it's not God. You're connected. You're connected to either a wrong person. And trust me, if there is a divine appointment and God has proper relationships for you and supernaturally brings them to you, go, no, that's okay, because see, I want this. That poor little 18-year-old girl. Such a sweetheart. She said, De Pastor Dennis, I learned how to practice your stuff. She's a preacher's kid, and he sent, she flew down here just to get ministry. That's the kind of passion she had. I know how to forgive. I know how to forgive. But these girls in school, they're, they're, they're bullying me. They're bullying me, and, and I'm forgiving them, but they keep doing it over and over again. And, and I taught her how to go on the offensive and just release love to them. And God turned her head. And she looked over to another table, and there were some girls. They were all Christian girls, and they became her best friends. But she had an agenda. She was locked into the in-girls. I got to be part of that group. I've got to be part. You miss what God has for you, and you think it's an innocent thing. But I'll tell you what, it's a divine connection that is the wrong. It's not divine. It's an ugly, evil connection. And that one thing can throw and destroy your destiny and your purpose. Women that say, I got to have a man, got to have a man, got to have a man. How many we saw, they even lost custody of their children because as a Christian, they couldn't break free of that. I got to have a man. You, you have a man, and his name is Jesus, and he lives on the inside of you, and he will be faithful, never leave you or forsake you, so it's impossible to be alone. So take that. And better no marriage than a bad marriage. All right? Trust me. I know we've made, we've, uh, God hates hates divorce, but I'll tell you what, to be real honest, there's a lot of married people that are divorced. Because divorce is a matter of the heart. Marriage is a matter of the heart. You need to resolve some of your internal issues where husbands and wives say, well, I never got a divorce. No, but you've been divorced in your heart for a long time. Time to repent. Open your heart back up to your mate. Release forgiveness. And allow God to do His work. Now, forgiveness doesn't preclude they're going to reconcile. Did you know that's the funny thing about forgiveness? It's unilateral. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, but I don't think everybody responded to that forgiveness. To this day, everyone has not responded to that forgiveness. But it's there. So that doesn't guarantee reconciliation. It just guarantees freedom from the pain, the sorrow, and the agony that's involved. Divine connections come to a divine assignment. Do you think the devil has an assignment? Of course he does. And it's to rob, kill, and to destroy you. <laughs> so you want to stay connected to a scenario. You want to stay connected to a person. You want to stay connected to a thing. You can miss out on God. And you know what? Those are the people that I see go down the tubes. They crash and burn. Of course, they'll play the blame game later and say whose fault it was. But in reality, how did you respond to the tough times in life? Did you turn to God or did you just play the blame game and be filled with resentment? Resentment is the opposite of resilience. God's got to teach us to... Boy, I've watched that enemy assignment. Never forgot the woman that wouldn't deal with her, with her uh, lustful ways and a man who wouldn't deal with his and pa other pastors sent them to me to help them 
They couldn't, they wouldn't hear it. Just did a retake on Sid Roth on this one. They did a reenactment of it. And out of 400 people, these two total strangers from two different cities came to a meeting of 400 people and they went like this. Do you think that was coincidence? That was a demonic connection. Because if your heart isn't for what God wants, you are a candidate for all of the wrong connections. Hmm? And what was God's intent? He has a purpose for proper relationships. What's the devil's purpose? He's going to give you another purpose. And the ones that I worry about are the ones that are socially acceptable. Like, well, I just want to go to school. I want continued education. I've seen more people made education an idol. You can take something good and, and literally destroy your life by making something else an idol. It will ruin you. Well, again, in the days ahead, we're going to really be promoting the journals and the peace challenge. Those of you that know how to deal with the emotional issues in your life, you know how to go to Jesus, you know how to get clean, you know how to overcome, you know how the Word of God abides in you strong, you've overcome the wicked one. I want to pray that we just take a few minutes at the end of the service here and just really, really cleanse our hearts from all idols, all significant things that may not be sin in and of themselves, but you can't let it go. If you can't let it go, it's an addiction, it's a habit, it's not God. Anything you can't let go, any person, place, or thing, do you know when Jennifer let her daughter Allison go? That's when she turned around. Isn't that something that in the spirit you could release somebody and say, God, I just love them, but I can't control them. I release them. Love releases. I think some of you have people to release today. What do you think? It might be a person might be a place let's close our eyes and just let the Holy Spirit search your heart not a counselor not some other person but God search me oh God for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways whatever person or situation comes to mind Feel the feeling down in the gut. And then let Jesus, the forgiver, I release that agenda. I release that person. I release that scenario, that whole person, place, or thing. Nothing's more important than you, Lord Jesus. have a song we do here called All in All. Let's make him our all in all right now. Lord, be my all in all. I relinquish even those good things that are socially acceptable, but they've taken the place of my love for you. I've been distracted. I've been connected in a wrong way. I receive forgiveness for any bad connections. Cleanse me from any connections that are unhealthy. And I release it, every person, place, or thing, to be under your lordship and to let the peace of God rule. Let the peace of God guide me. Let the peace of God crush the enemy beneath my feet. And let the peace of God guard my heart and my mind through Jesus, that impenetrable armor for my mind and my heart. How do I know if I've released it? How do I know if I've had a supernatural exchange? How do I know if there's been a genuine work of the cross here this morning? What would be the internal evidence? Not me telling you, 
but you knowing that it changed to peace. Some of you men, if it changed to nothing, nothing is good. It means the negative is gone. Okay. Let's stand to our feet and close in prayer. Father, I want you to repeat after me. Life is tough. But I've overcome. There you go. Seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.